We're training everybody on how to build big ponds. <laughs> That's right. You gonna get involved in any of this or you gotta keep the guys going? All right, I'll text Quint. you. Oh. Quint, hey Chris. <laughs> Like rip rap piles and stuff like that. How uh, I'm sure it'll be done mid September here. Mid September? It'll be completely wrapped up. Okay, so maybe uh, at the end of this month, we'll come back out. And Absolutely. Kind of, kind of lay out, lay out where, where, where we want where that needs to go. Yeah, we're good. Right. You doing alright? Doing good. Staying busy. I, I, I'm following you on Instagram. So are I, you now? I see all, all your projects. <laughs> okay. another two or three weeks. A couple more weeks, this place is really going to look completely different. Once we get, I mean, we got about one more day after today to get in the dirt for the dam. Here it's about nine feet deep, and then it gets to about almost ten out there in the center. Okay. Then I'm going to pull all the way back. That goes to the one flag from there. It goes all the way to that last burn pile that burnt, and then comes back around. Have you got any uh, saleable stumps or anything? That's my stump pile right there for the can't really do any holes because once we get down about four feet, I get into like a like a mica rock shell type stuff. Right. I'm afraid it's gonna start leaking if we dig through that. So that's why I'm digging down and I'll end up catching all this just to be safe. So probably not gonna do. Well, we can do. How far down is that? Uh, right at about the nine feet. Yeah. Okay. So, but in our shallows, we might do some trenches, maybe. And yeah, some, probably so. And maybe fill a lot of wet. We'll have to see once they go up there, you know, it starts coming back around as well. So I don't know until I start digging. Sure. So. All right. Well, we'll lay out this kind of like we've done in the past, maybe a few little, like three to three and a half foot like, shells uh, there. Shells. We'll probably do a nice one around your island right there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like a brown bedding area. Oh, yeah. That way it's protected out in the center of your pond there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and then we can put, we can drop habitat off the edge of that too. That way you've got, when fry come off the beds, They've got cover, and then you're going to be able to cast on the outside of that. You know, your bass are going to be gotcha. hanging out there. For your yeah. fishing parties. Yeah. Absolutely. Actually, I guess that would work out better if you if we need some deeper habitat. You do a trench and then pack it in with old timer. Obviously, this is the pond stops right there with that flag. I'm just getting dirt right here, but I want to say if I get it down to that depth, we're probably like seven feet or so. Five acres. Close. We'll yeah. see what it finals at. I Probably think it's four and a half. Yeah. I don't think my. I swear, every time you fly the drone, it looks bigger and bigger. Yeah. I flew it to measure, and from the dam was 468 feet, I think, and from dam to the far flag was 450 some feet. Okay. So it. At a square, it would be about four and a half acres, gotcha. so something like that. All right, let's move more dirt. All right, thank you. The cool thing, um, you know, one of the things that we'll we'll recommend, you know, it's kind of as, a, as the finish is that we can also do mounds. Um, Riprap is a is an inexpensive way to create structure in the bottom of the pond. Okay. You know, we'll we'll want to finish some of the shoreline with some artificial structures just because. So there's a difference between habitat and structure. Structure okay. is generally uh, to help gather fish, you know, for you to cast along. You know, it's it's gonna it's gonna have both benefits, but the the rock, the natural stuff, grows good beneficial algae and 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 you know zooplankton and that sort of thing. So that's gonna be an area for uh, fish to hang out. Uh, plants, uh, shoreline plants and things of that nature. Um, obviously, they would be once water's in it and we have we have a good water flow but right we can we can do some shoreline stuff that won't be invasive um long term you're going to have to have some management because there's going to be algae growth there's going to be uh, you know we can't control uh the birds in the sky and, and things right. that slither along the uh, but the uh you know so there'll be some management to it but um you know as far as setting it up we want to make it fishable number one you know because yeah. if it, me being able to show you fish at the shocking boat if you're not catching them that doesn't make the, the, you right. know, you want to be able to see those fish uh, and catch them. So some of that structure placement will be predominantly into the shore and, and probably uh, within six to 
six feet and less because okay. that's uh, you know under submerged obviously but we create kind of artificial reefs okay um now if, if you have access to uh pipe and uh, irrigation pipe um three eighths inch mm -hmm. is really good for the to make arms and you can google homemade fish habitat all day long if, if that's something you want to do uh, right. just as, as a money saver you can st that's something you can start looking for okay um pvc works okay the you know conduit uh just thin wall conduit is great because all you're doing is drilling holes and shoving pipes in it um, right and then anchor it with cinder box or cement uh, okay and we can what we'll do is kind of walk it and flag where those reef areas should go okay and then you know we'll give you a proposal for us to do it all and then uh you know after that we can discuss how we want to do it getting the getting the dump trucks of, of rock and stuff while they're still here is again we can put some of those bigger rock piles in certain deeper areas just to give some some areas to gather and then we'll put some near your spawning areas as well okay yeah it's a lot easier to do it while they're here absolutely absolutely um but that's really the key to setting it up as far as other things go long term you know a five acre system um we always encourage you to consider aeration aeration um with with all the the nutrients that are in basic stormwater now um you know runoff um you're going to have algae blooms and right. aeration is a kind of we we like to look at it as insurance policy for your lake we'll we'll provide a recommendation for that uh, there are solar versions of that and uh, powered versions powered is always going to be a little cheaper because you, when with solar you're right you're paying 6k up front just just for the solar panels and that right. rig uh, and without battery backup it's only operating during the daytime so right um, we'll have power here we can do it with 120 volt power uh, okay. so that's all you really need is a, is a gfi and then basically with that scenario for a, a system let's say it's four acres you're probably looking at about a six pad system and all you see at the top is like a, a bubbles basically okay it's, so it's this very, it's not like a fancy fountain or anything like that this is a diffused aeration system so basically what we're doing is aerating from the bottom up you just so, pump air in and then it rises right, to the right. top it's okay a, it's a it's a uh, rock and piston compressor that pushes air through micro it's it's like a aquarium kind of uh, okay. just on a larger scale but we put them primarily in you know you'd have one at your deep deeper areas and then we try to get movement up up there in our shallow water as well uh, but generally most of the pads are going to be in about six feet depths or greater okay um, and we we try to make them as symmetrical as possible when we do the layout um, that's something that can be done after the water's in we don't have that's not a it's not a phase one activity it can be pushed to the next year because as fingerlings the um oxygen consumption is not going to be extreme but you also the thing about aeration is we're reducing the overall uh, nutrient load in the in the lake by increasing the oxygen and by moving that water we're essentially turning this water over two to three times a day with an aeration system so no dead water you don't have the dead water you know especially if you got dogs and animals out here you know kids want to swim or anything like that you want to have aeration in place just to have the security knowing hey i'm doing everything i can to reduce my potential for harmful algal blooms and that sort of thing beyond that you know depending on what what is your primary objective for the fishery this is this going to be a do you want to push the trophy aspect yeah back yeah here? The, the the bass yeah. will be the so big thing back here you know we will set that up it'll be if, if we can get water in this thing this fall even as late as you know mid-november i would love to go ahead and get some minnows and bluegill established in here this right. fall that way by late the last week of june first of july next year we can put in our f1 fingerlings right um so i'd love to try to get some of those bait fish in here this and is fall. that that uh hybrid is that what you're thinking the, f, the f1 is a yes it's a it's a it's a cross between two strains of bass so it's a female florida with a northern uh large mouth or, or, or male northern and uh that f1 is the the first generation um of that cross they have amazing growth potential they've got the they've got the catchability of the northern with the growth potential of the florida fish so that's okay. that's why we're trying to uh we use them in all of our trophy systems i like them tremendously our best growth we took a, you know a two inch fish in 18 months and uh 
got about to three and a half, four pounds on, wow. on most of those fish. So we that first generation gets you there quickly. Um, and we'll then set up feeders, I guess, too. Feeders, yeah. We'll have two to three feeders out here. As far as the, the once we get through the first year, there'll be supplemental stockings with uh, our initial first tier stocking is fathead minnows and shiners. I don't use thread fins up here. They're they're so tricky to to grow and, and sustain, uh, and they require fertilization. Uh, it's a it's a gamble to put them in. Um, I've had them to go do very very well. Um, what we'll probably consider doing is once the water gets in here and we see kind of what natural bloom you've got before we stock the largemouth next spring. Uh, once it gets warm again, we've we've seen you know a few months of the water settling and everything. Uh, we may see if if it's a good candidate for for thread fin, just because they have to have a, a solid uh, plankton bloom in order to survive since they're filter feed. Okay. Um, if we can get them to grow in here, that would be amazing. Um, there, but at about twenty five hundred dollars a load, they <laughs> you can understand right uh, why I. Uh, you want them to you want them to work. I like a sure <laughs> I like sure things in life. Uh, and, you know because as a as biologists, we're all about what we can control, you know. And yeah. Sometimes you can't control nature all the time, but... Um, now, can we pull, and part of our plan is to pull, uh, what, bait fish from the front pond too, right? Right, that'll be a nursery pond. So our supplemental each year, we will we'll pull some of those fish out, uh, particularly your bigger uh, brim. Right. Uh, and we'll use those as, as to supplement the system. In addition to that, once the bass are big enough, uh, you'll you'll be in a rotation of uh, sh additional shiners and shiners, goldfish, and trout pretty okay. much every year to, to really push that growth. Uh, the goldfish get eaten up, uh, but we don't put them in until the bass are about two two pounds minimum. So the bass can eat them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then trout are great in the winter. We stock like a six to eight or a five to seven inch trout. Um, the beauty of those is that they're immediate bass food. They're huge protein feeder. Oh, and crawfish too. The trout are just major sources of protein for bass. They go down easy, you know, because of their, their shape. And with the feeders going, uh, you'll have something you can catch all winter long, which is kind of cool. Yeah. In the spring, you've also got, I mean, they'll grow to a pound in here uh, with the feeders going on. So in the spring, before it gets too hot, you can come out here and catch fish and have, a, you know, eat, eat trout okay. uh, of whatever's left in here. And that's, that's probably, depending on the, the growth the first year, that's, we're probably, a year or two away from starting the trout program okay and we're looking to put in a deep well for top off because i don't think i'll get 10 million gallons out of the ground but right um is that something people do or is there any recommendation i need to tell the well driller versus like he was drilling for a house i mean the, the biggest thing is you know you're better off don't don't put a inch and a quarter <laughs> outlet you know put the biggest outlet coming out of it as you can so okay. you can maximize it um, for a pond this size um, think of the well as a, a way to help with evaporation uh, you know that right. quarter inch a day that you might be getting uh, if the well runs well you know and, and you've got lots of gallons per minute certainly run it the fact that we're not going to be putting a fountain or anything in here that can exacerbate evaporation you know a well is a good idea uh, okay. most of our folks uh, that have the ability to do that go ahead and do that on the front end I think what else? How about a dock? You do anything with a pier? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do some sort of dock somewhere. I've been waiting for him to get, kind of get a little further along to come down here and plan more stuff out. Sure. But we'll do a dock, and there will be some sort of area for swimming. Okay. So you got to think about that. Where your swimming area is, we want to put a diffuser basically just on the edge of that. So okay. um, we've put them in. We, we manage a lot of several camps in the mountains. Uh, we've installed aeration in Lake Lore off of their okay. beach area, just to make sure we've got good circulation in those areas. Because we don't want to, we want to limit the potential for, uh, again, the harmful algae blooms, the cyanobacteria and stuff, um, for being in that area. You know, got it. I tell everybody, with a pond, swimming in a pond, uh, it's a natural system. You know, it's not a pool, but by having aeration in place, you're reducing the potential for for bad stuff to happen. Gotcha. Uh, a lot of folks want us to like sample for like bacteria and things like that, and I tell them like we can sample today, at right now, and 
those numbers may change by this afternoon. You know, that's the, gotcha. that's the, that's the tough part about it because it's not a closed system, but having aeration in those areas and just making sure that it's getting treated, you know, uh, when it needs it. Uh, when you start seeing the green film, say, hey, don't go in the water. Let's get, let's, let's get that taken care of. And so with you guys, is that something, how do you do it? Like I know with like a pool, it's a, you know, weekly or whatever thing. How do you guys? Basically we're a one-stop shop. So we get on a routine uh, every month. Uh, we're usually a 12 to 18 month program. Most of our customers, we say a minimum of 12 visits, you know, we'll come out and basically that's a that's all included so okay. whatever price we give you it includes treating treating the lake so okay you, it's not like you're i'm sending coming out here and going hey we need to treat it's gonna be this much right when you pay the bill we come out if you have issues we come out uh and we take care of everything okay because uh, as experts in the field that's it's our job to be able to predict predict some of that stuff um and so that's what we do um and that includes the sampling uh, the fish sampling we include some basic uh, stocking in here. Uh, the, the shocking surveys may alter what we put in, or if we see a deficiency somewhere, we may have to say, hey, we need a few more of these, but uh, we handle harvest for you. That way you can say everything's catch and release and we can, we'll take care of the harvest. With the gotcha. shocking boat. So we'll gotcha. take, we'll call the fish that need to come out. You just get to fish and, and have fun and not worry about that kind okay. of thing. And then also we'll, it'll include pulling the seine in the, in the nursery pond or shocking up the, okay. the bait fish uh, will be included in that. As well. So it's, it's, all, it's all pretty comprehensive. Cool. Plants. Plants. So <laughs> shoreline plantings, uh, they take nutrients out of the water. They attract, you know, insect eating bugs. Uh, they're pretty uh, and they just, they help give the pond or lake a more uh, natural appearance. Uh, they aren't going to grow in, in depths over eight inches, generally. Hmm. Uh, may, maybe as far as 12, but that's pretty much it. They are removing nutrients and they do help stabilize your shoreline. What we do for most folks is on big systems like this, we're not going to wrap this whole, <laughs> or recommend wrapping this whole, whole uh, shoreline with plants. We're going to recommend uh, probably four or five 75 to 100 foot areas where okay. we, that are going to be highly successful you know so cove areas where you do have maybe some slow water that sort of thing mm -hmm. um we're gonna we're gonna pick the places where hey these plants are gonna have the most uh chance for success provide hardy four inch pots minimally because a when we leave you're gonna have a more finished looking product and but also uh they have a much higher rate of survival than you put bare roots in here the deer will just come by and pluck them out of the ground they'll be happy to see that yeah <laughs> yeah the nice thing about the plants, they, they grow and thicken up in these in these little pockets. And then over the years, they will spread. So you'll get natural progression, And but they're easy to manage. They can be treated or, or pulled uh, very easily if they, they get somewhere you don't want them. But over the years, it gives a really nice aesthetic, it does provide fish habitat. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's become part of our normal uh, recommendation and plan when we're when we're designing lakes and ponds you know it's 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 going to make everything kind of pop and the idea too is to kind of break up that shoreline you know when it's all groomed and everything we want to have a couple of areas of color so right. mainly your corners is where we're going to start those out and that that helps with trying to the natural approach to taking care of the pond as much as possible right right anything gotcha. we can do to reduce nutrient concentration is kind of what we're going to be doing and you know with fish production We'd rather to have some natural nitrogen removal and phosphorus removal from plants as opposed to, you know, having a situation where we have to come in here and manipulate it with like some phosphorus binders and that sort of thing because we need we need some phytoplankton bloom. So that's the one thing is is to grow big fish. This is going to be a greener pond. Okay, okay. it's not going to be uh, a clear number one. Clear doesn't exist unless there's something wrong with the water <laughs> chemistry. And if you can see down three feet that means there's something screwed up uh, in the microbiology of that pond we want uh, about 12 to 18 inches of visibility no more than two feet and we want a nice green phytoplankton bloom that means that our food chain is balanced and without that you've got to have zooplankton for little baby bass to eat or else they can't grow you know because when, when we stock them they're literally that long right so at that point, they're eating, you know, small, very tiny insects, and, and but a lot of zooplankton is kind of getting them going. So 
in a super clear system, they're not going to have a lot of success. Gotcha. Because um, it takes them, you know, as fast as they do grow, uh, they've still got to eat to to get to that size. As far as managing expectations, it's going to be healthy, but it's not going to be gin clear. You know, it's not a swimming pool. It's a, right. it's a fish pond. Right. right. Um, so that's kind of what we're going for out here. Okay. You guys got anything you want to add or, or yeah, ask? Yeah. Sure. Went over it well, so it's um, gonna be great. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really gonna be a neat place. You know, the other thing that we'll do is once you've got the fish in here and established, uh, we'll we'll probably get you a subscription to Smart Fish app, which is a uh, basically when you when you catch fish, uh, it's just it'll be on your phone. And you can help us provide data about your pond if if you're so inclined. And you just put in the lengths and weights of the fish. Okay. And, and, uh, and it's, I was it's a cool way to, to hold on to that data. I was watching uh, Bama Bass, you know, his build. I don't know if yeah. you watch him. And he's he got some sort of kit that you actually track them. Oh, the pit tags. Yeah. 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 We tag all our fish. Um, we're there's a hatchery that we're getting ready to start working with uh, that are we can probably do pit tags. We haven't been doing them. Uh, we usually tag them when we shock them. We put a, okay. a, a dorsal tag in them. Right. Uh, and then that way we can check growth rates on recaptures, which is kind of cool. Okay. Uh, but we, I was just telling them about pit tags on the way over here. Okay. So, so that'd be something by the time we get. get to your bass, we'll probably be in pit tag land. I mean, the industry's changing, it's growing, and, and there's a lot of cool things. Obviously, online, there's a, there's a ton of uh, resources. We're, we're excited about it. So you guys are out of Raleigh? Yep. Okay. Garner's our Garner. headquarters. Yeah. Okay. If you know where White Oak and Rainer Road come together, we're yep. we're we're right there. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think I actually rode by and I said, yeah, I did. It was the other day I had to go out there and I was like, oh, that's where they're at. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime, man, stop by. Uh, we got our fish system shut down during the summer. We don't ever handle fish during the middle of the summer because, well, dead fish smell like money. Uh, right. <laughs> and when <laughs> it gets hot, you can't handle fingerling fish. They just go to, they go to, uh, south really quickly. So we we shut down usually. We get the we get the fingerling the bass in uh, around the last week of June, and we distribute those first week of July, and then we're usually we're usually done. And that's it until until the fall. Then right. We'll start back up about the middle of September. Mm -hmm.